I'd like to thank Dave for having me come out today. My name is Randy Pringle. I'm the Fishing Instructor Guide Service, where we're going to talk about some spinner baits and uh, some buzz baits right off the bat, and some of the territories of what I'm throwing out and what I'm looking for when I look at the California Delta in tune. Um, you can do, you can utilize this actually in any lake or river system that you have around here, but predominantly I'm going to talk about the Delta as we live right next to the number one body of water in the goddamn country. You got to love that. So let's start right off. One of the things that I, I want to talk about is people ask me all the time is I like to locate the fish and uh, where do I find fish? It all looks alike. Where do I throw it? I know that I can go down a bank and start throwing stuff, but if I just walk down a whole bank, you know, and the bank is a quarter mile long, two miles long, where do I stop? Where do I start? And I tell them, well, there are reasons why you start and stop on any body of water. You know, there's there's a reason, and we're going to go over some of those ideas today. And the other idea is, well, then you're just going to have to call me up. <laughs> all right. First of all, um, I truly believe in a couple different kinds of spinner baits. Uh, there's a couple on the market that I like. Um, what is in the Assassinator spinner bait? It's got the parallel blades. It's not the inline style. The parallel blades gives it a little more clack. If you guys have not thrown this, it feels like you have a fish on when you're throwing the bait. So you throw that bait up, and as you're reeling the bait up, you come through the water. The blades go like this, and they whack each other, and they stop, and they flutter, and then they continue again. So every five to six times their revolution, they hit each other. And when they hit each other, they flutter for about a second and a half. And what that does is it emulates that school of bait fish going through the water. When we all fishing, most of the people that I've watched fish, they'll go and take that fishing rod and they'll throw that bait out there and they'll just go, shoom, and then they'll hit that spinner bait and they'll start cranking it back in, slowly rolling it down the bottom, bring it up out of the water, shoom, and then they'll throw it back out and they'll slowly reel it down the bottom and they'll work back, well, boom, finally get hit. Well, I call that person that's a chuck and winder. That's the guy that I go by, and I don't have a problem going behind that person because that person's going to get the ambush fish. I'm going to get the better ones. The better ones is what Mother Nature is trained to do, is eat several different style of fish. Um, can anybody tell me if there's a school of minnow, which one gets eaten? Tell me which one gets eaten. The injured one. The injured one. Why is that? That's for you, buddy. Why is that? Uh, easier prey. Easier prey. Good. How about anything else? Tell me. Somebody else. Not just the injured one. How about the dumb one that's sitting behind the school and sitting there lagging? That's why you see a bunch of little baby ducks on the surface where there's like mama had 12, 10, or whatever the, the, the amount of the eggs that she laid. And then pretty soon you see seven, then you see five, and then there's one left. And that's because that little one that's eating over here by itself being the, the one that's kind of staying away from the protection finally says, oh, mama's leaving. I'm going to rush up to the school. Boom, gets eaten. And that's what happens. What you want to do is look one of the crippled ones in Mother Nature, crippled, injured, stupid. They just don't last. They're going to get eaten. Or if they're off color, that's why you don't see very many albino whatever is out there. They just get eaten. So when we're throwing it, uh, especially on spinner baits, I like to twitch them. I call it kicking it, kicking that bait, kicking my wrist. I don't move my arm. I move my wrist. It's kunk kunk. And what this blade is doing for you is automatically doing that. It's fluttering while it goes in the water. So as you're retrieving it, it's going to die. And it's unique because it'll be going around the water, just coming through the water, all of a sudden it flutters. Boom! That's when the fish eats it. I have been throwing this thing for about two years now, and it is phenomenal. It was rated number one spinnerbait in the country, this bait right here. I mean, not California, the country. So you guys don't want to look into this one. Super slick blade. It's called Assassinator. Okay, the other one that we throw, and I know a lot of you guys throw them, it's made by Persuader. You guys, how many of you guys throw this Persuader? You guys ever thrown Persuader? You guys over here? Persuader, you ever thrown this Persuader? No? What are you in the back, sir? Never thrown a Persuader? Persuader is pretty unique. It's using high grade components. Have you ever thrown a spinner bait, sir? Yeah. Okay, this one's yours. Okay? What you want to do with a Persuader, any type of a spinner bait, but with any type of spinner bait, you want to make sure when you touch that blade, it moves. And if it doesn't move and doesn't wiggle like this, it's not worth having because it's going to make more job, your job, harder to catch a fish. And we want to make your job a lot easier. So when you're throwing a blade in the water, you want that blade to have as much rotation and flash as possible. One of the baits right now is chartreuse. A little bit of chartreuse in all my spinner baits right now is phenomenal because right now the bluegill is the arch enemy of a black bass. So we want to make sure we, we take care of that. And that is with, and with a blue, 
the chartreuse, and I like to use a lot of the oddball colors, the gold and silvers, and one of my favorites is right now is this one. I just took it off of Dave's wall, and he has these actually. I, I was looking over there, and I said, hey, man, do you have this one? He goes, well, which one are you looking for? I can't tell you until I find it. Oh, you got them. So it's the chartreuse and white one, and on the back side of the blades are silver. So it gives you that flash in the daytime. So you can throw this all day long. Also, you can throw in the morning, which the color blades in the morning are very, very good this time of year. It gives you more reflection because the color is going to pick up its own self. In the afternoon, you want something with more flash. This also gives it that opportunity. So it's an excellent blade. So if you're not one of those persons that likes color blades, the gold blades. He also has that in stock. Outstanding. Both of them. Both colors are excellent. So now, spinner blades, we talked about it. This is the Persuader. This is the Assassinator. Comes in multiple colors, all different sizes for the lakes. Let's talk about where we're going to fish this bait. When I said about chucking and winding, a lot of guys will go down the bank and they'll just go whack, whack, whack. They'll come down this river right here, and here's these little berms in the middle. And they're throughout a river system. You can pick any one of our rivers. You'll see little berms in around them. You'll say, well, what do I fish? It all looks like there's an island here. There's a straight wall there. There's a bin in the slough. And as you're looking at all this stuff, it all looks alike, but we're going to narrow it down. This time of the year on a slough like this, I've got to find a couple different things. First of all, I want to find the least amount of current in the area because that's where the spawn is going to occur. The fish are not going to travel miles and miles and miles to leave this area to go find a spawning area. And then travel miles and miles and miles to come back. What they're going to do is make it easy on them. They're going to find the least amount of current in the area available to them. That's what they're going to do. So let's break this thing off and narrow down the field. If we have an area like this, we cut this off. You're going to see the bend in the river. You want to draw a straight line of current. Current doesn't do this if it doesn't have to. It's going to go straight. So if you took a straight line and drove a straight line like this, you're going to see it's going to bump some of these points, right? But it doesn't hit these back bays, these, these curves. And in these curves is where you're going to find more weeds. And the reason why you find more weeds is because the, the weeds don't get ripped apart by the current. So there's going to be more current there. So now I've taken this and I've blown it up. Here's one of those curvatures. Now, everybody says, well, I just see just a mat of weeds there. Well, if you took it in a low tide and really looked at those weeds, those weeds are like this. You'll see the little points and pockets throughout the whole thing. They're just not one big long line. If you see just one big long line of weeds, out. Get out. Leave that area. That's not the area you want because the black bass is a structure style fish when these ambush ter territory. So you want to find a fish that's got to have something he can ambush his prey from. And that means if you see one of these big walls that are like this, and here's a Thule wall, you'll be fishing that all day. And you'll say, well, I've caught fish on that. Yeah, but you fished a lot of it to catch a lot of fish. So over a course of two or three hours, you fished it and you caught two or three fish. That's a fish an hour. To me, that's not a good day. That's just not a good day on the Delta. No, you want 20, 30 fish in a day. And then an eight hour day, that's more fish. That's three and four fish an hour. That's what I want, okay? And my clients, I want them to keep busy. We're just beating the bank because it, this looks good. That's not what we want to do. So we're looking at banks that have this because when the current goes through this area, you know, as it goes by like this, these points and pockets in the bait fish, right now you got a lot of baby bass in the water you know, fry everywhere, and you got bluegill everywhere. They're going to be sitting here setting up, the bass are going to be setting up right here, waiting. They're going to be sitting right behind these little breaks, and when those when those bait comes swimming by, they'll come out and jet out just like a trout, and eat the bait and come back. So if you have these, in, these intricacies like this, in one of these little bins, that's the bait you want to pick. If there's no weeds at all, it's not the time of the year to have that. Get out. The ambush territories are not as productive in those areas. You want to find weeds that have got these indentations and breaks. Now, when we find this in one of these bays, you're going to find the more active bass. That's what's going to be important because positive fishing is part of positive areas where the fish are going to be more active. So that's what you want to find. Now, looking at this little deal here, you can see where the berms are going to be more active. A lot of people don't look at that, but I do. When I open up a map or I know an area real well, first thing I look at is how much current does these berms have and why are some of these berms have fish and why some of them don't. And I tell them because if you're going to fish spinnerbaits or buzzbaits or stuff like that on top of these, 
you're going to want to find these areas where the berms are the best. This time of year, I want them just out of current where the fish can spawn. Not a lot of mush. A lot of mush means that it sits, there's no current at all. And if there's no current at all, the fish can't blow away that silt. They get silted in. That's why something like Frank's track, which you guys mentioned, Frank's track is changing all the time. You know there's beds in Frank's track from one end of, the, of it all the way across to the other end. There's beds everywhere out there. It's because they have to adapt because it keeps on getting silted in. Every time you turn around, something changes out there. And so one area will be great one year. It'll silt in, and the bass can't utilize it, so they have to migrate to another little area. So we're gonna, that is some of the things that you want to learn as you're fishing. So go back to this. So now we're, we're down here. We're going to fish this little bay right here. This little bay is blown up, and it's this spot right there. Okay? We're putting the boat, and this is what people ask me all the time, where's the boat position? Well, the boat's position on the outside, approximately about 20 feet away from that bank, about from here, that red truck right out in the front, right, gentlemen, right behind you, if you guys want to turn around and look at that. Not my red truck, that other one that's oxidized. Whose is that? Is that yours? Okay. I was hoping not to get beat up at the end of the day. All right. So now, the other thing is, we want to make sure that because the Corps of Engineers has designed the delta pretty much the same. They've taken these rocks and they placed these rocks all over the levee and they went out from those rocks approximately 15 feet on the low tide as a crow flies. And I give it that number 15 feet because it could be 20, it could be 10. But we're not going to spend a lot of money out here. So the California is only designed to put out out about there. And that's where you see those weeds just about die right there because there's nothing else to adhere to. That's why the weeds only go out so far off that bank. So if you guys are wondering, those bank, wow, well, shoot, the weeds always come out about X amount. It's because the rocks only go out for X amount of distance. So you know in your mind that the rocks are about that distance and the weeds could adhere to something better. And that's what they'll do. So that's your range. So now if you know that, where well, you know it now, now the way you're going to cast that is you're going to cast on angles like this. Never, never, never cast for a spinnerbait or a buzzbait unless it's a specific target. Don't like this. Bad deal, because the percentage of your cast is weakened. You want to have a longer area, a longer range, so you want angles to be your benefit. So you want to keep going down this bank, casting on angles. Always. If you're the one that casts straight on like that, you're a chuck and winder because you're just not covering the area. Because you want to come across this area where those weeds are and that bank is, hit all the sides. You want to hit this positive zone, this positive zone, and the outside positive zone. And you have a bigger margin because you're going to be covering that water better. If you cover it this way on a straight line, you're going to cover this water, this water, this water, and one straight line. I want to cover more angles. This is what I want. It's very important. When you throw in that spinnerbait, it's very important. I watch a lot of my clients in the boat. They do the exact same thing over and over. We, how many of you, you guys have all fished the California Delta? I would assume you guys all have. Great, great. And have you, sir? Good, good. Now, this back alleyway, we know why that back alleyway kind of doesn't have any bushes or weeds. Do we know that? Do we know why? Yes, sir, over there. Do we know why? Well, the reason why is because on a low tide, there's, there's no water there. So when the water rises again, now we got that gap. We all know what that gap is in the summertime. That gap is honey. That is the alleyway of life. Okay, When we're throwing in there, we want to keep that bait there in the longest period of time. So when I throw that bait in there, you know, I throw it up in there, and I click my reel over. I keep my rod tip as high as I possibly can. So I keep it low, it's going to fall down. When I throw it up in that hole and I kick that wrist, it keeps that bait floating close to the surface, so I get that three to four foot margin. And I've got to keep it in that strike zone as long as possible. Because the longer I got to keep it in there, the longer I'll bring a fish from the right or the left side to make him come over. Because you'll see the fish coming. Oh, here she comes, here she comes, here she comes, here she comes. Boom! Oh, I got him. So if I can keep in that zone right there long, that's where the key is. The other day when I was on the Delta, sure enough, I'd pitch it up on the bank, rod tip up, and I'd kick it twice to get the blade flowing, and I'd keep it up. Crack! Oh, I just saw that fish come out of the water. I'd go back up there and again. Bam! There she got it. So I'm the hell I got him on. So that's what you want to do. You want to keep that bait in that margin. It's very important when you're talking this, a spinnerbait that's going to flutter, you want a good fluttering spinnerbait. If you don't have that, you're not going to keep it in that strike zone very long. 
you are going to keep it in there and it's going to start just fading and it won't work as well. The other key thing is when I'm talking about making sure that flutters real well and keeping those blades and kicking them out, keeping that rod tip up and turning that reel handle as fast as you can to get it going, is you want to throw as close to those rocks as possible. Don't throw on this front side. This is not the place to throw it. This is the place to throw it. You got to put it right up on that rocks. That's why you, you'll, you'll beat these things up. You know, this one, uh, it's been beat up. The, the paint is held up. It's knocked a couple hot eyes out, but it's still held up. Okay? So the paint, you'll knock apart a lot of the start of the blade, but you want it to work real well. So when you're throwing on these back alleyways, you want to keep that blade turning as fast as possible. Now, the key, which I tell people all the time, when you're throwing a spinnerbait of any sort and you throw it in that water, the reason why I kick it, and I've shown some very, very good anglers of my kicking technique. The reason why I kick it, because when you throw a spinnerbait in the water, when it hits the water, it takes about this far before it starts flashing. Water is only this deep anyway on that backside. It's not that deep. We all fish that alleyway. It's about that deep. It goes out and it goes about four foot deep at the maximum. At the maximum, four or four foot deep. And you want that bait to flutter as much as possible. So when I throw that bait out, I kick it, getting that maximum flash, tracking that fish. But if I throw it out there and hits the water and it starts to sink, and then I reel it up and I start bringing it up, all I'm doing is I've wasted this much and the bait's pendulum towards me. You know what pendulum means, right? If we took this whole bay right here, we're going to erase this part right here, we're going to leave this up, and we took a side angle to it, here's the bank, here's those weeds, and here's the boat, okay? And if I threw it into these weeds, or over the top, and landed right here, and if I didn't do anything, as I click over, the bait's going to slowly pendulum towards me. We all know what willow leaves need. Force. You've got to push the water. Without any movement, the willow blades will kind of slap side to side before it hits. The Colorado blade is the round blade. It'll have more thump to it. It'll wobble a lot more. But it'll also get pick up a lot more weeds. So we start that off by kicking it. When we kick it, we keep, what, we keep it right down here and be able to move it, and we work it right out. Right up and over the top of that weeds, get it back on the top of that weeds, ride it across the top, and then drop it back down again, just like you would. It's very difficult to go through that stuff because it's real thick. We all know that. So we want to make that a maximum time right here by kicking it, choop, choop, right when it hits the water. Throw it out, kick, kick, and I guarantee you, try it. It'll improve, improve your spinnerbait fishing tenfold. Okay? Any questions on spinnerbaits? Yes, sir. Here use plastic traders. Plastic traders, slowing down the spinnerbait. Good, good question. When you're throwing it, hey, why don't you try that? It's plastic. When you're throwing it, anything that's going to add to that tail, you have to understand a couple different things. It's going to slow down your bait, and it's going to give a bigger target. So it's very good at a certain time of year. This time of year, put on a, a trader and have a lot more flash or wobble, depending on the areas where you're fishing, I recommend it highly. If you've got a narrow area, I don't like to use it as much because I don't want to have that fish flash out and hit just the back of that trailer. Because right now, this is the time of year they're swinging at the bait and they're not eating the bait really good. They're coming out and they're slapping at it because they're saying, get out of my kitchen. You know, it's mama bass out there saying, yo, you're in my kitchen. Bam, get out of my kitchen. I don't want you in here. That's what's not happening. They don't want that. Now, as the year progresses, now their they're spawn's over and they got a little baby fry in the water. Now you want to put some lot of beef on the back of this. Now you want to make it the biggest bluegill coming through their territory. You can put a big old giant double twin tail right here with some oddball colors, chartreuses, some whites, offset the colors of it, maybe some blues. And, and now you can work it real slowly. It's got a lot of wiggle to it, keeping that strike zone longer. Go with a lighter head. Keeps the bait in there a lot longer. Okay, that'll work real well. Good question. Okay, anybody else got a question on the spinnerbait? Yes, sir. What about on low tide when you don't have the bass alley back there? Are you just going to target the outside weed edge? With the good question. Take that. All right, good question. The reason why it's a good question is because I had that right here. I drew it for you already. The boat's there. It's showing you. You have these gaps, these runways, these little runways. Now, these runways are so important because as we take away the bass boat, because you didn't make your payment, okay, didn't make the payment, the mama said you better bring a, a ski boat home next time, or you know how that goes, all right? 
Now, see, if we had some women in here, I'd be saying the opposite. She wants to go more than you do, and a whole bit. Now, these are the alleyways. The weeds usually have, on that low tide, is that. Like that. They're not just straight. They're ins and outs, ins and outs. So now you're going to put your boat. Remember, we took this. And exactly like this, we magnified it. It's all we've done here. I'm going to put that boat right like this. Like that. And I'm going to hit those little points and pockets. If I see a little point coming out, pitch it up past the point, walk it down past the point, get real close to that point, kick, 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 boom. He's going to eat it because he's set up. Now remember, here's the point. If you see these areas and that current, there's a little bit of current there. Remember, I don't want dead water. I want the least amount of current. Least amount doesn't mean there isn't any. I want the least amount. Because what the least amount means, the current's there, and it can blow away some of that silt. Now, some guy's going, man, you know, you're pretty intricate. Yes, because the bass are that smart. That's what you want to know. You want to make sure you're fishing a bank where the bass can spawn. It's got to have that criteria, or you're not going to catch those big ones. Big ones don't go where they don't can't get food. It's their main source. It's not the tide. What's the most important thing? Food. Got to have food. Next one is tide to bring the food to them. Got to have deep water access and you got to have spawning ground availabilities. With those criteria, you will find a big bass. If you remove one of those criteria, you will not find big bass. Remove one of them, you'll see. You will not find it. Too shallow water throughout the year, that fish will leave that area. They won't be there all year long. Think about the spots where you've always caught a big fish and they have the, somewhere in that area. You'll have those 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 criteria you need. Okay. Now, as we're fishing this, if the current's going this way, this is what the way the current's going. And here's one of these points magnifying greater. There it is, right there. I'm going to magnify greater. Okay. Magnified it. Which way is that fish going to be? The fish can be facing. Towards the current. This way, right? Yeah. Because he's like a trout. So now, here's that bass. Big little smile on his face, waiting for that food. Here's another bass. Now, this time of year is phenomenal fishing, this time of year, especially this time of year. And you're going out there on a low tide. Everybody's going, oh, man, I wanted that low tide. Because I wanted, I wanted that high tide so I can get back in that alleyway. I get in that alleyway in the high tide. But now I got a low tide. Oh, man, I'm, this is going to be terrible. No, 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 no. Segue right into the buzz bait. Here it is, okay? Persuader's buzz bait. A couple of them on the market I've seen that I really like. This is the Gold Rush. I, I, I put my name on this blade. It's excellent. If you guys have seen the Gold Rush, it's a 24 karat gold plated. It has a blade and blade concept. Chirps right out of the box. Gotta love it. If you guys haven't seen this one out on the market, Dave Bashak right here has got them in stock. Outstanding blades. What this does is allows you to go real slow. One blade goes one way, one blade goes the other way. On that low tide, you come up alongside that, you put your boat right up against that weeds, and you pitch it straight alongside the weed lines. And it's not because I'm a duck or a deer or, you know, you guys are going, look, he's a turkey hunter, man. He's a turkey hunter, man. No, 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 no. That's what you want to do, man. When you got your, when you got your, this is my blade rod. I'm going to put my blade rod down. Get my spinnerbait rod out. See, it doesn't feel right if I don't have the right rod out. There, and I got a seven footer. Okay, feels right. There it is. All right, 20 pound test. I'm ready to go. Shroom. I flip the baby out. I just cuck, cuck, cuck. Rod tips up high because I'm going to walk it right across this. Okay, here's the key. Here's the key. How many of you guys have thrown a buzz bait and watched that fish swirl on that bait? And he doesn't have it. Has it ever happened? The reason why that happens is, one, the fish wasn't positioned right, or two, you didn't throw in the right direction. That's the reasons. Here's what happens. That fish is here. The current's going here. Which way do you run your boat, sir? You have a boat? Run into the current. You run into the current. So you're running this way here. See? What do you do? Away from the current? No. You go with it or no, into, it? into it? Into it. Into it. How about you? Okay, well, you, well, you got his boat? <laughs> into the current. All of you guys are correct. If you go into the current, you're going to throw it beyond the target. 
bringing it back through over the fish's back where he can run up this way and eat the bait. You'll get a better hook percentage ratio. If you go the other way, which a lot of guys do because it's easier on their trolling motors and it's easier for them to control the boat if they're going with the current down the bank <whistles> because they're going this way. What happens is you're bringing a buzz bait or any other style bait you're going to crank in and you're going across this way right here and you're building that bait back about 20, 30 miles an hour. That fish has to rotate its body to hit its prey. That's what the swirl's all about. He has to come back around and eat the bait. He wasn't in position the way you threw it, or you threw it in the wrong position. To, to maximize your spot, if you know that fish is going to be positioned on this side, I want to throw it beyond the target and bring it across so he sees it and comes up over his shoulder and eats the bait. You'll get a lot more hook sets. Now, you throw a buzz bait out, and you're reeling it back in. Cluck, 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 cluck. You hear a guy on a water skier going by. You don't pay attention to it. Now, the jet skier coming behind you. What do you do? You turn around, pull your 45? No, no, seriously. No. But you do turn and look because it's irritating. But a buzz bait going from one end to the other, going cluck, 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 doesn't doesn't entice him until you hit that stump. Cluck, 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 Hit the side of that toolies. Tunk. You get bit. Every time that happens, man, you bump the toolies, bump a stump, bump a rock, they eat it. Isn't that true? So let's say you don't have that. You're just fishing across the weed point, weed lines. That's where the kicking comes in. Throw it out there. Cluck, 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 And when he sees that and it stops and it changes his rotation, wham, fish eats it. That's what's important. That's why I do the kicking technique. I do it on every bait that I use momentum. Crank bait, same way. I'm reeling down. When you bump off a rock, isn't that when the fish eats it? How many times have you got, you reeled it, and right when it takes to bend, and it starts coming towards the boat, wham, the fish eats it. Is it because the fish said, holy smokes, it's getting away, it's coming in that boat. I better eat it. I don't think so. What happens is the bait's traveling, and it changes its trajectory, the fish eats it. Because it changes its directory, and you change that direction. Same thing with a buzz bait, same thing with spinner bait. You throw it out. Cluck, 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 Now, here's the, here's the deal. When I teach this when I'm in my boat, and I'm out there taking people out there in my boat, and I'm teaching this, they want to make it a rhythm. No, don't make it a rhythm. Change that completely up. You just sit there. When it hits the water, cluck, 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 and she'll eat it. Happens every single time. You get more strikes on it if it makes it look like it just had a heart attack. So you'll make it click, 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 click. Going. That's when you seem to stop and go. Why do you think the rip bait works so well? Because it changes pattern. It doesn't look natural. It looks like something's injured. Choop, choop. Pause, pause, pause. Choop, wham. Eats it. You really just swing it and you jerk it out of your arm. That's why that bait works so well. So, when we're throwing stuff like that, how do you recommend the buzz baits? This is not. How many people have ever thrown a persuader? You guys have thrown a persuader? You in the back? You thrown a persuader? Is that your brother right there? Yeah, he got one. So this one has to go to you, all right? This is the, uh, the black and red one. Don't use this on the Delta. It was illegal in two different other states, and they're probably going to illegalize this one in the Delta because it catches too many dang fish. So if you're going to use it when boats come by, set it down to let them see it. All right, buddy? All right. All right. And make sure you use big line. Stop using that six-pound test with a buzzbait on the Delta, okay? Just don't do it. <laughs> you learn real quick. When I had, a, I, I had a client the other day, he goes, I, I brought my rods, and you said to put 20 on one. I got it. I said, well, I got my other rods. I said, well, good, what do you got on that one? I got 12 on this one, and I uh, got 10 on that one. I said, put that one and that one back in the car, and <laughs> well, I'm left-handed reel. You'll learn. <laughs> You'll learn the other way. Now, does anybody have any questions? I know that low tide on a lot of different baits freak people out. And, and it shouldn't, because what you've got to do is do one thing. You've got to be able to adjust. When you talk about buzz baits and um, spinner baits, and like I'm talking about right now, um, you have to be able to adjust. One of the things that's very important to realize when you're throwing against this stuff is when you throw it out there because you are fishing a weed environment. If you look at this buzz bait right here, it has a flat head. 
It's flat on the bottom, which gives you the time to, to jump up on the surface quicker than the other ones will, which is very important in my mind. Because when I throw it back there, I want it to get on the surface as quick as possible because my strike zone is small on the delta. We all know that. It's not a big, long strike zone. When you're fishing this stuff right here, you see these little potholes, you know? You see these. You get a good pair of polar glasses, you'll see these spots. You'll see this is all dark, and this is kind of an olive green hole. And these olive green holes, you're going to come across it, come across that, and they'll eat it. The thing with this one, with a persuader, you can go like this and bring it, and then as it gets closer to those weeds, I can lift my rod tip up, and it skips like a rock. With the other ones on the market, it rolls to the side, and you get the weeds always, always, every single time. Oh, it's getting close to that weeds. Oh, it rolled over to the side because it's a barrel head style. Okay, It'll roll. The fishy head style rolls. So that's why I like the flat head. It gets me up on the top of the water. I can scrape it over top and then slow it back down just by pulling it and lifting it up and it's like a water skier just hitting the surface of the water. Works real well. Try that out. Now if you get short strikes, a lot of people ask about short strikes. You know, do you put a trailer hook on it? There's a couple things that I like to do. If I'm fishing open water, I'll take I'll take a, uh, a piece of the, the tubing, surgical tubing, cut me a little section out of the surgical tubing, okay, and then I'll take a two-aught treble hook. Two out treble hook. I'll put the surgical tubing over the eye of the treble hook, and then I want two of them up and one down, and I'll poke that in it and bring it around. So now I got a treble hook on the backside on open water. Now if I'm fishing around those weed beds, I'll clip that bottom one off. It's the one that's welded. So if you ever have that problem figuring out which one it is, when they design a hook, there's two that come across. They weld the bottom one on. So you clip that bottom one on, so it's going to be like that. So they'll be up just all the time when they're riding, and they'll keep it steady. So if you get a lot of short strikes, that's a good ticket. Another little trick when you're asking about trailers is you take a long trailer, take a piece of fire line, tie it to the back of the bend of the hook, run it back about two inches or an inch and a half, tie it to another hook, a big wide hook, short shank wide gap hook. Dave's got them on the wall here. I looked over there. You're going to tie that, you're going to thread that inside of a worm, and then thread it on like this, then tie it down. So now you have the worm hanging out like this, and it's going to wiggle, and then you have that one further back on. Works really well. Now that piece of braid, you can use like 65 or 80 pound, so it'll still give you the flex. But you don't want to use mono, use the braid. Okay. Any questions on the buzz baits? Simple. Targets you're going to be working on, if you're fishing those weed lines, is you're going to find on that low tide the outside weed line and find the ones that got the bifurcations and the inputs and outputs, little points and pockets. If it has a straight line, get off of it. Because the bass, where's the first spot the bass is going to be? The biggest bass gets what? The prime real estate. Going to get the best spot. So, if the biggest bass, here's a straight bank and here's the weeds. What am I going to fish? Where's my boat? I just pulled in. Here's the tide going this way. What's the first spot? Point on here? I'm going to run this boat this way. Very good. I'm gonna fi now, I'm going to fish this back side, right? Okay. I'm going to fish that. Okay, I'll fish that. Now I've got a low tide. There's my, there's my wall. Now where do I fish? Fish right here? Where else? Then what do I do? Leave. Leave. You fished the two key spot. Magnify it. I just did. Okay. It looks exactly like that. That's a straight wall. Okay. Straight wall of weeds. Oh, I, I agree with you. I'm agreeing with you. If it had this, this stuff like this, yeah, then I'd I start fishing these pockets. You find weeds like this all over the delta. You'll see them everywhere. You'll go like that and there'll be a weed patch like this. And then it's, this water gets too skinny. I want here, one here, I'm out. Big fat fish is going to get the number one spot. I want the best opportunity to catch a fish. And I'll hit 30 of these places in a day. 
and I'll have 15 fish because I know the percentages. There's a lot of fish in the delta, and I'll get my percentage out of these spots. So don't stick around and try to fish this whole bank. You watch guys do it all day long. I mean, sure, you'll be driving down the delta, and you see a flat wall, and these guys will be going down the bank. How are you guys doing? Oh, we got a few. Oh, all right, great. Bush. Bush. Ah, ah. Bush. Boom. All right, guys, thanks. Because he fished right here, and you went, thank you very much. Thank you very much. We out. That's positive water. If you continually do that, you'll catch more fish. I try to teach that to all the people that go out and do these seminars. Consistently fish the positive water. The other thing is, if you have a bank that's straight and you have that berm that comes out like this, and this bank is like this, okay, if it's like that and you don't have the straight wall, Most active fish are going to be where? Right? Because the current's going, we'll go this way again. Okay? It's going to be in the pocket. It's most active fish, right? Correct? Of course, there should be one here. Of course, you might be one here. Now, if I come to this point, first spot I'm going to try, let's say I pull in. Now I'm going to go, I'm going to come around because the current. Here it is. Boom. I'm going to hold it. I'm going to hold my pattern there a lot easier. Boom. I catch this fish. Right? So I caught that fish. Then I go down the bank a little bit. I try here. I don't get bit. I try here. I don't get bit. Do I keep going? No, it's time to move. Just move. Yes, there could be some fish here. Remember, your, your time frame is against you. Continue to move. Run right over here. Fish this spot. Fish this spot. Leave the dead stuff in the middle. Get out of there. The next one you come to. Come up to the next one, drop here, fish here. This is what I do. Nothing. Out. Fish this spot, I'm gone. I'm mixing it up because I don't want to fish one whole bank and spend two or three hours trying to figure out one bank. I want to fish one bank, and then I'm coming to another bank that's very similar looking. Fish that bank, pick it apart, picking those little positive spots away. I'm going to try to fish this one this way. I'm fishing this bank. I'll fish this bank. It's like this. This way. And leave this alone. Leave that alone. And I'll change it up. I'm looking for the pattern. If I take one bank and fish the whole thing and I don't get any bites on it, I didn't learn anything. Does that make sense? Make sense? Okay. So I want to mix it up. Don't want to keep on fishing the exact same stuff. And I watch people do that all the time. For instance, I drove around, was it yesterday I was on the water, and I, I would pull into an area, I'd get up on my bow of my boat. No, not right. I could look at the water and say, it's not right, let's go. Got to find the water. What I was seeing was the weed beds on that part of the area where I wanted to fish. It was getting low water, getting real skinny, and I could watch these weed beds go like this. I mean, they're real wide weed beds, and there was nothing here. There was no holes, nothing. It was just empty, all weeds. There was no water back here, very little, if any. And these weeds right here was all murky water. Couldn't see anything. It was just terrible murky water. Didn't want it. Didn't, didn't look right. Current wasn't on it right. The weeds weren't doing one of these. Lousy tide making, I want the branches waving over. I want those weeds to move over. I want to see some movement. There was nothing. It's time to get out. Didn't look right. That's what you guys need to start working on when you look at the delta. Is, is everything working in your advantage? Is the weeds folding over? Is there movement? Is there bait being moved? When you look at that, are you looking at uh, the bank and are you seeing movement of any type of bluegills, minnows, or sh shad, or something like that? If you're not looking for that, and if you are looking for that, you've got to look for that. It's something that's so important when you're looking out in the water. Look over your area, your territory, and find those positive water, and you'll catch more fish. All right?